This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, committed to teaching, research, and professional training with degree programs in multiple locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Embassy Suites by Hilton Charleston, an all-suite hotel and conference center minutes from Yeager Airport and Capital Market. Reservations and brasserie dining information available at hilton.com. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Welcome back to the legislature today. I'm Bob Brunner. Thanks for joining us. In 2022, state tourism revenue set an all-time record with $5 billion in traveler spending. Those gains impacted all areas of the state. Today, Randy Yoey shows us Almost Heaven is on full display as Tourism Day filled the state capitol rotunda halls. Thousands of people from throughout the state, country, and world experience the thrill of whitewater rafting on West Virginia rivers every year. Some are whitewater veterans. Many first-timers come to West Virginia to experience the New River Gorge National Park and raft through the heart of one of the state's most beautiful areas. Chelsea Bricker is marketing leader with Adventures on the Gorge, one of several whitewater rafting outfits. Chelsea explains that these days, these Fayette County tourist destinations offer much more than rafting. We do zip lining, we do rock climbing, uh, we do rappelling, we do mountain biking. We have an aerial obstacle course as well. You can do a hiking trip at the new, in the New River Gorge. So you really can come and spend an entire week there or just come for a couple days. We also have a pool right on the edge of the New River Gorge National Park so you can relax if that's your idea of an adventure. A hidden tourism gem in Mason County, the West Virginia State Farm Museum offers snapshots in history representing the industry of the farm as well as the state's farm heritage. Museum Executive Director Tim Kidwell says following a COVID-19 downtime, 2023 museum events will be back in full harvest. We'll start off with a spring uh, steam and engine show. Uh, hopefully, weather permitting, we usually have uh, 50 to 60 antique engines and tractors on display uh, in operation. Uh, then each month we actually uh, hold, a, hold an antique tractor pool. Uh, then during the summer we have a uh, tractor ride and a show. And we'll be wrapping up the year this year with our um, fall festival. One tourism day display presented by Jay Fryman with Back Roads of Appalachia showcases his popular regional motorsports trail ride organization, which is now getting legislative approval for people to ride into West Virginia. Backroads of Appalachia is a nonprofit organization who does economic development through motorsports tourism for the poorest regions of Appalachia. We work in eastern Kentucky, southwest Virginia, eastern Tennessee, and now West Virginia. We're working with West Virginia State Legislature to develop a trail system here and promote it to bring that tourism into these small towns who haven't had anything since coal went out. So that's what we do. The state currently employs more than 44,000 direct tourism jobs. With estimated growth, they expect about 24,000 annual job openings, many of those in the hospitality industry. Those tourists have to be housed and fed. The past few years, Southern West Virginia's Hatfield-McCoy ATV trails have rivaled whitewater rafting and winter skiing and bringing in thousands of out-of-state tourists. John Fichetti, Deputy Executive Director for the Hatfield-McCoy Trail, says last year they sold 95,000 trail passes and 80% of those were non-resident, out-of-state people. Paquetti says the challenge is finding places in the coal fields for those trail riders to lodge and eat. We need more entrepreneurs. Uh, we need more development. Um, we're seeing some of that now. We saw a couple big resorts uh, uh, come in in the last couple years. Uh, the Ashland Resort down in McDowell County, they're growing. 
Uh, they've been around for about 10 years. Uh, we've got the Devil's Backbone over in Red Jacket. They've got almost 50 cabins and in the process of building 100 more. Uh, so the developments are coming, but we need more. In Nicholas County, meanwhile, high schoolers have started the Good Golly Coffee Company, giving students a head start in one of the many tourism hospitality trades. Katie Goetti, the Pro Start culinary teacher at Nicholas County Career and Technical Center, says food tourism or food niches are really quite popular right now. And a barista job may offer more interest and advancement than your fast food endeavor. It's great for these students. It's an empowering first entry level job into the business instead of fast food because as a barista or roasting coffee, you have to learn the flavor profiles, which is a great entry level culinary. Uh, skill and also you have to have customer service and get to know your customers and what kind of how they want their coffee how they like you know, what blends they like and how they take their coffee. West Virginia's record-setting 2022 tourism gains were impacted throughout the four corners and two panhandles of the state with even stronger revenues expected in 2023. For the legislature today I'm Randy Yoey. A bill passed in the Senate Monday morning requiring all West Virginia hospitals with emergency departments to have a trained sexual assault nurse examiner available to treat survivors 24 hours a day. Reporter Chris Schulz and Emily Rice have that story. Senate Bill 89 passed the Senate on third reading Monday morning. Issues around proper care for victims of sexual assault or abuse were also a topic of conversation during interim committee sessions. Senate Bill 89 addresses those issues by calling on the state's hospitals to implement training as soon as possible to meet their 18-month deadline. Senator Mike Wolfel of Cabell is the lead sponsor of the bill. He says he's been working to pass this bill for three years. People have been known to walk out of the hospital, victims. It's just too intrusive and they wait hours. So, I mean, to me, uh, as a state, this should be a priority that victims of sexual assault are treated in a respectful way and that very intrusive rape kit is completed and a trained person is there in the room with them and it's just it's a it's a priority and now it by law will be a priority. Wolfel says that as a former prosecutor he understands the important role of rape kits not only in seeking out justice but also in helping survivors to find closure. We've done a lot in the past to uh, eliminate to the extent it's possible, the backlog of rape kit. There were literally thousands of rape kits that were sitting untested. So there is a backlog, but we have state law that we've enacted in the last couple of sessions that has eased that backlog. But we want it to be prompt. We want the prosecutor to get the information he or she needs. We want the case to go to trial, and we want the victim to have closure. During discussion of the bill on the floor, Wolfel asked if West Virginia's hospitals would have a hard time complying. In response, Health and Human Resources Committee Chair Senator Mike Maroney of Marshall mentioned interim committee discussions and said the hospitals understood how important this training will be for their patients. You know, we had some uh, pretty uh, intense, I would say, intense um, discussions during interims concerning this. Uh, the hospitals had a presence there like they usually do everywhere and they're you know paying attention and it's it's a um, it's a mandate it's a mandate of nurse training during the probably the worst nursing shortage in our state's history right. the timing is not ideal but it's, we've waited two years to, and they've known it's coming and they were going to ramp up a little bit uh, if you take the effective date you got another 18 months which gives you three cycles of training to get through so they were they, they're, they know it's the right thing to do, and they, they're okay. For the legislature today, I'm Chris Schultz. Senate Bill 89 passed unanimously with 32 yeas, two absent. The bill now goes to the House of Delegates for its consideration. The Senate passed three other bills Monday, including Senate Bill 59, which changes how unemployment benefits work in West Virginia. Chris Schultz has more. Senate Bill 59 makes several changes to the system of unemployment benefits in the state. Senator Tom DeCubo of Kanawha is the lead sponsor of the bill. He says the bill aims to help target benefits fraud that saw a spike during the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, I got contacted that I had filed for unemployment and all those benefits were, were kicking in. 
I obviously being a pulmonary physician during 2020, 2021 is the busiest I've ever been. Um, but it's outside entities, it's foreign governments trying to get in, break in terror system, uh, computer hackers. So there's always going to be more fraud. What this does is gives more latitude to workforce development state to be able to defend against those uh, fraudulent activities. Takubal also said the bill aims to alleviate the burden of unemployment tax on the state's businesses. He said the bill ultimately aims to modernize the state's unemployment laws, to reflect the modern workforce and work environment, and try to help more people get back to work in a modern world. What we believe we can use this bill to help match jobs uh, that are good jobs for people looking for those and, and improve our workforce participation. Uh, we're still one of the worst in the country. Uh, part of that may be that uh, they're having more difficulties. The bill also lowers the maximum number of weeks unemployment benefits can be received from 26 weeks to 20. Senator Mike Caputo of Marion voiced his opposition to the changes during discussion of the bill on the Senate floor. He drew from his own experience of being on unemployment and said the changes Senate Bill 59 makes are too harsh on workers. When things got a little slow in the mining industry and myself and my friends got laid off, we wanted to go back to work. We wanted to go back to work desperately. But sometimes things just weren't available to us. You know, there was a time when, you know, folks were laid off for years. But somehow, for some reason, this bill reduces the number of weeks that a worker can collect unemployment benefits. Today, an unfortunate worker who gets laid off can get a maximum of 26 weeks. If this bill passes, it will be anywhere from a minimum of 12 weeks to a maximum of 20 weeks. Well, I'm going to tell you, things get tough sometimes. Things get extremely tough. And sometimes 26 weeks is not enough. But I'll tell you what I do know. I do know that 12 is not enough. And I do know that 20 is not enough. When you're trying to pay the light bill, Takubo said the bill is just one tool in the state's toolbox to address workforce issues, and they are always looking for more. We're trying to, to look at all facets uh, to help as many West Virginians as we possibly can. Uh, and so one thing I would say is legislators are all ears. What we need is, is all help we can get. So um, anybody out there that has uh, uh, ideas that maybe would help us with this or any piece of legislation, please let us know. For the legislature today, I'm Chris Schultz. Governor Jim Justice and the legislature are at odds on what to do with budget surpluses the state is currently enjoying. Those surpluses range into the billions of dollars. Earlier today, Justice had a town hall meeting in the Capitol Rotunda to promote his position. We're two thirds of the way home, Mark. You know, and from the Senate side, the Senate is asking questions and mulling over, and we tried. We tried to move toward their side because they wanted to go big, big splash in the palm, 50%. We did it. And I am very, very hopeful, and I'm going to stay extremely positive and say, you know, they're continuing to, to work and do good stuff. Let's don't drift into bad thoughts. Let's stay positive, good stuff, and everything with everybody and say everybody's trying as hard as they can for us to get there. But at the end of the day, and I always call the voters Toby and Edith, but Toby and Edith are dependent on us right now. The House of Delegates recently passed a bill that follows Justice's outline of a 50% reduction in personal income tax over three years. Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr, a Republican from Putnam County, said the idea is a non-starter in the Senate. The Public Employees Insurance Agency, known as PEIA, is the health care beneficiary for state employees, notably teachers among others. Rising costs in health care have put the program in jeopardy. Governor Justice declared employee premiums would not raise when he was governor. So far, that's been true. Those rising costs have now driven the PEIA into a $92 million deficit, one plan that keeps employee premiums flat through 2027 also projects a nearly $400 million deficit that same year. Reporter Chris Schultz wanted to look into the problem further 
and he brings us this interview. Thank you, Bob. Fred Albert is the president of AFT West Virginia, and Delegate Charlie Reynolds is a member of the House's Health and Human Resources uh, Committee. Did I get that right, Delegate? Is it? Yes. Yeah, okay, excellent. They both join me now on the legislature today. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So, PEIA, this is an issue that is, is not new uh, to the people of West Virginia, but we're finally actually seeing some action on it. Um, and as many people know, this actually, well, it didn't originate, but it really caught people's attention immediately before the session, right in your backyard, uh, Delegate, with Wheeling Hospital announcing that this summer they would no longer be accepting PEIA insurance. Um, have either of you heard anything more from uh, uh, providers or institutions across the state that they are considering similar action? I personally have not heard, other than I do know that several of our members from AFT around the state have contacted me to tell me that Kroger's is no longer, no longer accepting PEIA for prescriptions. Now, I'm not sure if that's why that is. Uh, I have not contacted Kroger's personally, but I have heard that Kroger's no longer uh, will be accepting PEIA for prescriptions. And that Walgreens, I believe, is one of the drugstores who have stepped up and said, we will, we will continue to take prescriptions. And if you had a, your prescriptions filled at Kroger's, you can come over to Walgreens. So I, I don't know what's going on there, but that's the only other thing that I've heard. Other than I did hear Senate President Blair say early on with the situation with the Wheeling Hospital that this could become contagious. Uh, at this point, I don't think it has, but you know, it possibly could. So Mr. Albert, you, you kind of precluded my next question, which is uh, what have you been hearing from your um, members about the PEIA situation? I mean, you gave us a good idea there with prescription issues, but I mean, are they getting the coverage that they need as of right now? Well, so far, yes, other than you know what's been announced in the Wheeling area, but I think there's a lot of consternation or concern that that could rapidly spread to other hospitals because we know that the reimbursement uh, for PEIA is under what the reimbursement for Medicare is. So that is a real issue. So let's talk action. Delegate, we've seen some activity in the Senate on the very first day, the second, I think, if not third bill um, that the Senate suspended its rules to pass was this PEIA bill from uh, Senator Ryan Weld. Uh, what have you seen or what are you hearing on your side of the legislature? Well, uh, Chris, uh, from day one when the announcement was made, then I took action, I wrote a letter to the governor, uh, and the governor's uh, office was in contact with me. Kudos to the governor's office, they're moving fast uh, as they can on it. Uh, and then uh, Weld out of the Senate, like you said, pass some legislation. Uh, there's also some legislation on the House side. And so what we're doing is we're taking a look at all the legislation that's up because we want the best for our West Virginians. And uh, on to what you were saying, uh, it's funny you mentioned the prescriptions because you were absolutely right. Right before I walked in here, Kroger's just sent me a text saying that I was cut off from my wow. prescriptions. I also have PEIA insurance. So it is an issue, and it's an issue that we're taking uh, real concern. This, this isn't something that's going to uh, fix itself overnight. This has been kicked down the road now for several years. It needs to be addressed. And uh, so I want to make sure when I go to vote on a bill that it's the right bill. So I want to take a look at everyone's bill. And there's quite a few bills. We got a lot of smart people in the, in the legislature. Can you share any concretes with us? I mean, any particular bills that you're looking at or any action that you hope to see come out of your uh, committee? Not right now. I'd rather not right now. Um, all right, well, that's, that's fair. But I, uh, so one of the things that we do know that's been going on is the fact that, as you mentioned, Governor Justice has been taking action. Um, for several years now, he has been committing $100 million to kind of backstop PEIA. I wanted to ask you both, I'll start with you, Delegate. Um, is that sufficient? I think I know the answer to that question, but also can we rely on that? You know, the governor said that he's going to maintain that throughout his time in office, but uh, that's coming to an end here, unfortunately. Yeah, he, he, uh, he has, and, and I believe he will, 
Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a savings account that we keep taking money from, and uh, that, that savings account's gonna run dry again. So it needs to be, I think, addressed. So Mr. Albert, same question to you. I mean, is this sufficient, and, and can we continue to rely on this system? Well, first off, I wanna say thank you to the governor who has kept his word so far, and he has kept the premiums uh, from rising, from you know going up, as he said he would. But we all know, as Delegate said, this did not happen overnight. Uh, it's been going on for a while, and we had a task force uh, after the 2018 teacher walkout. Uh, but, you know, PEIA doesn't just affect teachers, it affects all public employees in West Virginia, or most public employees in West Virginia. Um, and we had a task force put in place to try to find a long-term solution, and that task force sort of fizzled out. I don't know when was the last time that they met, but this is ongoing. Uh, it is concerning because when the governor's term is up and whoever follows him, they're gonna have a mess on their hands, we're afraid, because the projection is, I believe by 2025, perhaps, there could be like a $346 million shortfall in PEIA. So we know something has to be done uh, before then. And I think most employees do expect at some point they're gonna to have to have some skin in the game as well. They're, they do expect that, to pay some more on their premiums. But um, again, we're grateful to the governor for what he's done. We just need to find a long-term solution. So Mr. Albert, I'll continue with you. I mean, as you've just laid out for us, this is an issue that we've known about for at least five years. You mentioned 2018 there. Um, let's, we've been talking here in the short term, let's talk long term here. I mean, for PEIA to continue to be viable moving forward, not just beyond this legislative session, what do we need to see happen? Well, we need to look for, at funding sources. Where can we go? You know, we have an, a major surplus right now. Uh, and I know that everyone has their hand out, uh, wanting their share or their fair share or some money, but it's, I, I consider it an investment in our future for our uh, public employees, for our school teachers, for our service personnel to invest in their future to make sure that their health care is secure. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Albert. Uh, so, Delegate Reynolds, I mean, what, in your opinion, do we need to do uh, you know, is what Mr. Albert just laid out for us sufficient? Well, it, it could be if you went a certain route, uh, let's say employees have to, uh, rates go up and they may have to pay a little bit more. Uh, that's one way of going. Uh, there's other options out there. I, I don't know exactly what to, until we all get together and I, I, I will know when I go to vote, let's put it that way. But I think that, uh, there's probably five or six options out there that could be taken. We could go down different routes with this. So I'm not going to get into details, uh, but there is some things out there we could do. And, and one of you know whatever we pick, whatever we do, it's going to be difficult for the employees uh, because the rates haven't been going up, and and they should have been. Well, it's not just the rates, right? I mean, there, there is a certain role that the state also needs to play here for its employees. Am, am I wrong in that? Well, uh, should the state have ever been in, a, uh, in the insurance business to begin with? <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, I, I just would, uh, instead of taking and, and telling you, I think that we should uh, take money and throw into it, or I think we should take it, just immediately raise the rates on the employee. I think we ought to take a look at all the aspects. Of, I, I can't go into it any more than that until I see all the options because I'm not going to, I don't want to jump on something that I could be completely wrong about. Well, I certainly appreciate you being pragmatic. We're in our final minute here, gentlemen. Are there any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to share with us just briefly before we have to go? Well, I would like to say, you know, for years, in lieu of pay raises, uh, school teachers and public employees were given good benefits through PEIA. And then there came a point where they're out of pocket copay, the premiums were rising to the point that money was being taken away from them because they didn't have a pay raise. So we have to consider that as well. And I don't think anyone is thinking, I'll never pay any more premiums. 
I, I believe most people who have, are participants in PEIA agree would that. expect to, you know, at some point have to pay some more uh, premium-wise. But I think also we need to all come to the table, as the delegate said, and sit down and look at some long-term solutions. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much for your time. An incredibly complicated situation. We appreciate your thoughts on the issue. Back to you, Bob. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. That brings another day of the 60-day legislative session to a close. Tune into the legislature today, Monday through Friday at 6. We'll have more news and interviews from the 2023 legislative meeting. And remember, West Virginia Public Broadcasting is covering the session daily in our radio news program, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily floor sessions of both the House and Senate on the West Virginia channel, and we stream those on YouTube as well. I'm Bob Brunner. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, committed to teaching, research, and professional training with degree programs in multiple locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Embassy Suites by Hilton Charleston, an all-suite hotel and conference center minutes from Yeager Airport and Capital Market. Reservations and brasserie dining information available at hilton.com. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com.